Would it have been what I have written for an accord that I'd like everyone to sign? With stricter goals and requirements to stick with them? No. It was a compromise. And again, I come back to Monday being President Kennedy's 100th birthday. I was at his inauguration when he said, what you all know to the citizens of America, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. You remember that? You don't remember it, but you remember reading it in the history book. I remember it because I was there as a student. It's your it's history to you. It's my youth. But the next sentence, and this is the point, the very next sentence in the speech, the president says to the citizens of the world, ask not what America can do for you, but what we can do working together for the freedom of mankind. And that working together, that lack of condescension, that presence of respect working together is sorely lacking in the statement that the president made yesterday. And I'm on this score, since there may be questions on other subjects now, I would just say this. When we had the um, vote on the omnibus bill in December, I voted against it. You know why? Because it was pathetically meager in addressing the needs of coal mining family, coal miners in our country. Now, I don't, I'm, I'm not an advocate for coal. I think it degrades the environment. But I am an advocate for coal miners. This administration loves coal but rejects the coal miners. If you go to my office right now, you'll see a statue of a coal miner there that my father gave me that was in his office when he served in Congress and has been in mine since I've been there. Finally, in this last bill, we did something about coal miners' health care, but we still haven't honored our responsibilities to them for pensions. So when the president talks about coal, it's like, what, what, if you really care about those workers, you would have insisted that the Congress uh, meet the uh, responsibility, the promise uh, that has been made to them many years ago when President Truman was president. So, they're so in, it's so inconsistent. It's really hard. On the one hand, on the very same day the president's saying, I'm doing this because I promised I would do it in my campaign, he's issuing a waiver on moving the capital uh, from uh, Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, which he said in his campaign that he would do on day one. Is he telling us that day one in his administration has not come yet? So the inconsistencies are uh, disconcerting. But I'll tell you this. What, what happened yesterday on the climate issue is an embarrassment to a, a country. And it should be an embarrassment to him personally for how he answers to his grandchildren. Another question? Yes, sir. Um, yesterday, um, Representative Schiff said regarding uh, Devin Nunes, and the uh, subpoenas issued in the... Uh, so Russia. could you speak a little bit louder? <clears throat> Yesterday, um, Representative Schiff said regarding Devin Nunes and the uh, subpoenas being issued in the Russia probe, um, he said that you've spoken with Paul Ryan about this. Um, can you tell us about your discussions and, and your concerns about Devin Nunes' continued role in the probe? Well, I, I probably won't share the entire conversation. I have conversations I've had with the speaker on this subject. And let me just put it in this context. The Intelligence Committee is a relative is a small committee of the Congress. The leader and the speaker, the speaker and the leader, appoint those members. They're not subject to any approval by the rest of the court. It is a pres it is our appointment. We deputize people to serve in the interest of our national security and to do so with integrity, patriotism, and in the most apolitical way possible. The behavior of um, Nunez, whatever we're calling him, chairman, recused, unrecused, I didn't mean recused when I said and gave you the impression recused, whatever his, whatever that loosey-goosey is, mm -hmm. is beneath the dignity of being a chairman of the Intelligence Committee, which has special status, the chairman and the ranking member, be they Democrats or Republicans, the chairman and the rank, have special status, special access. So if he recused himself on subjects Russia, then he shouldn't be having access to documents relating to subject Russia, and he shouldn't be issuing separate subpoenas, attaching them to bipartisan uh, subpoenas that were issued uh, this week. So my uh, dismay, my objection, uh, has been uh, conveyed to the speaker on more than one occasion.
Um, to follow up on that, I mean, does he keep seem concerned as well, or is he fine with it? You have to ask him. But it all comes back to him, because this is his appointment. And his appointment acted in a way uh, that was weird. I mean, it was irresponsible, but it was weird when he did what he did, going to the Ubering to the White House, this, that, and the other thing. And then for him to give a... Did you think he had recused himself? The press had some attitude that he had separated himself from the Russian investigation, but he it hasn't. And then really, in all fairness to Mr. Conway, who now has that responsibility, he should be the one who has that access and that uh, regard as the uh, top Demo Republican, uh, really a very important position in terms of the intelligence gathering for our country. So, no, I have conveyed that. You'll have to ask him. But really, it all comes back to the speaker. It's his appointment. Yes, ma'am. Um, on another subject, Hillary Clinton said today that she thinks it's possible Democrats could retake the House in 2018 and said she was helping in that effort. Is she a good messenger for the Democratic Party in 2018? Well, I, you know what? Uh, we, there are going to be all kinds of messengers in this. And as with our great and diverse state, some people will be more helpful some places than others. But um, I'm not, I didn't hear that. You're telling me now that she says she's going to be helpful, and that would be great. Uh, she is highly respected uh, in our country, and uh, uh, it's going to take everything to defeat the Republicans because they will have endless special interest, secret, dark money flowing like black substance into the campaign, suffocating the airwaves with their misrepresentations. So it will take everything. But we're very proud of uh, our chairman, Ben Ray Lujan, and the job he's doing uh, to mobilize at the grassroots ladder level to um, <coughs> uh, recruit candidates. And there's something happening in our country beyond politics. It's about the spontaneity and the organic nature of uh, people coming forth and seeing how public policy affects their lives. They march, whether it was to protect our care, whether it's about a juvenile justice system, whether it was about saving the planet, whether it was about college tuition, whatever the immigration, whatever the subject, they saw that their presence and their voices were heard and seen and, and that elections have ramifications. So we're very proud of the, again, the spontaneity and the responsibility. People saw the urgency. They see the urgency. They want to take responsibility. That gives us opportunity. And we are proud to enlist all of our leaders in that effort. What's your assessment right now of your chances of taking back the House? So you want to talk politics. <laughs> well, it, right now, I mean, just comparing it to 05 and 06 when we did take back the House, in 05 when we began our effort to win the House for the Democrats, Harry Reid and I, we were new leaders, and this was our now chance. Uh, the uh, President Bush had just newly been elected, and he was at 58 percent in the polls in January, February, when we started this. You know where President Trump is in the polls now, in a much different place. By the time we got full swing into our campaign, President, oh, people told us, don't even bother with that because there's going to be a permanent Republican majority. If President Bush could win after with the Iraq war, there's going to be a permanent Republican majority. We didn't accept that, and we went forward. So we have a, our discipline, our strategy, our unity, and our harmony, and, we, and wonderful candidates are stepping forward. So you can have the money, the message, the mobilization, that's all required, but you have to have the candidates. Yes, sir. Um, Madam Leader, it now looks like Congress is, may have to vote on the debt limit yeah. before August. Do you still support uh, a clean increase in the debt limit, or might you try to get something in exchange? Will you support a clean increase even if you're getting railroaded on other issues? I mean, can you talk a little bit about... Well, how do you say... It's not clean if we're getting railroaded. I, I, you know, I, I don't... Here, let me just respond this way. The debt... Lifting the debt ceiling... It's something that Congress does. We don't have to. The Congress says that the full faith and credit of the United States of America is not uh, in question, but we, we will be taking this vote. I don't have any intention of supporting a debt, a lifting the debt ceiling to enable the Republicans to give another tax break to the wealthy in our country, uh, to uh, further 
exacerbate the challenge that is created when they have their trickle-down economics. Tax breaks for the wealthy increase the deficit, and now we have to we have to lower the deficit. So we're going to stop investing in education and and other initiative uh, in research. Cut eight seven billion dollars from national institutes of health. So I want to clean when we say a clean debt limit, we mean not one that enables the Republicans to have a giant tax cut cut for the rich. And that's not why we're lifting the debt limit. Lifting the debt limit is about obligations already incurred. Yeah, is that your, an answer to your question? Well, I you mean, look like I, you have I don't a question exactly understand on. how that would manifest itself if, if, if they're going ahead with a budget that calls for tax reform, but it's unclear uh, who the taxes Tax well, it isn't unclear. I mean, for, well, the, you're right. Let's say there are two things here. One is the president keeps saying the tax bill is moving through Congress. It doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. So you understand the frustration. It doesn't exist. There is no tax bill moving through Congress. Uh, the tax bill the Republicans proposed well before the election would add $5.5 trillion with the TR trillion dollars to the deficit, enough money to solve all of the uh, shortfall, any um, uh, funds needed uh, to keep Social Security solvent for 75 years. But they want to use it as a tax cut for the rich. So if they come in and say, we're giving a big tax cut to the rich, we're throwing a few crumbs to the middle class, and we're calling that a tax cut, well, that's not what we're lifting the debt ceiling to do. So but that's a completely, you know, it should be a different subject. We should be working together in a positive way to put together a tax reform for simplification, for fairness, lower the co corporate rate, um, close, um, close special interest tax loopholes and the rest, and do so in a way uh, that grows, creates growth. And I say to my members when you go into the meeting, be agnostic. Wherever the good ideas come from, we embrace them if they grow the economy in a way that increases the paycheck of America's workers and reduce the deficit. What they're proposing is not going to reduce the deficit. It's only going to uh, give tax breaks to the rich and increase the deficit. And that's not any reason to lift the debt ceiling. And the last question, yes, sir. Um, unrelated to, or related to Andrew's question. Um, outside experts like the Bipartisan Policy Center say that uh, there's actually enough room to run still under the borrowing, under the debt ceiling until October, November. But uh, OMB Director Mulvaney has said that uh, they want you guys to do it by August. Um, a, do you believe that it has to be done by August? And B, um, will the Democrats help raise the debt ceiling before you're given a, a concrete drop debt date? Well, the. Uh, I don't know who you're using as a reference for October and that. Bipartisan Policy Center. Okay. Well, everything we're hearing is that it should probably be done before we leave the end of July so that it could be ready for September because it could happen in August. One of the reasons that my understanding is, again, is that we need to do it sooner is because many people are thinking many entities in our country are thinking they're going to get a big tax break from Trump for next year, President Trump for next year, and the Republicans in Congress. And so the, the revenues are not coming in as fast this year as they should. In other words, part of when, that, when this happens is how fast the revenues come in, how much the revenues come in. And so people are making decisions about their balance sheet relating to something they think is going to happen uh, relating to uh, rates, et cetera, for but next year. Treasury so, has a history of crying wolf on this, though. Yeah, but it, it doesn't make it. We might as well do it in, in a way that uh, uh, be uh, in front of it instead of uh, behind it. But as I say, we're not there, and I think the Senate, as, as the Senate leader has spoken to this point very clearly, we're not there to lift the debt ceiling enable the Republicans to throw a few crumbs to the middle class while it gives a big tax break to the high end. The, the accelerated um, timetable on it, I believe, is because the revenue has not come in as anticipated. So 
it may have to be sooner than was projected. Uh, but we shall see. And uh, again, we'll have we'll have that we'll have that debate. And speaking of taxes, I think that the decision the president made on the Paris Accord, I think that the budget that he has put forth, again, really speaks further to the fact that he should show us his tax returns. It's very important that we see his tax returns. It relates to the Russia. What do the Russians have on Donald Trump politically, personally, and financially that he won't show us his tax returns to give us some? Maybe that would clear up the issue, or maybe it'll be a path to some other questions. So show us your tax returns. We talk about lifting the debt ceiling. We talk about tax returns. We do know uh, that what he proposed, what he was talking about before, would have given him a tax break of $30 million on the year that he has revealed his tax returns, a tax break of $30 million. Show us your tax returns. Anyway, we come back to um, the fact that something very different happened yesterday. I've been telling my members this is really about policy. It's not about personality. It's not about tweets. It's not about how much sleep somebody gets at night and how balanced they are the rest of it. It's not about any of that. It's about difference in policy. And that manifestation comes in the form of a budget, and it comes in the form of decisions like the Paris Accord. And this is something that is about the children. It's about the children and the responsibility we have to them. I think that the president was irresponsible to the children. Thank you, all.